Hi everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's book launch. My name is Jasmine. I'm from Carcanet Press. I'm laughing because my cat really wants to be involved in tonight's launch. Uh, as we all do, I'm so pleased to invite you um, to welcome you here tonight to celebrate Tara Bergen's new collection, Savage Tales. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm just going to run over what's going to happen this evening um, and then I'm going to hand over. So just some housekeeping before we begin proper. Um, Tonight, uh, the event's going to last about an hour. Um, please find the chat box, say hello to us, uh, let us know where you're watching from, um, let us know what you think of the reading, get involved in the conversation there, please. Um, you should also all be able to talk with each other there. Um, I did change the set setting, but let me know if you have any technical problems throughout the event, pop those in the chat and I'll try and help you. Um, now, Tara is here, she's going to read for us, and while she's reading, she's going to share her own screen um, and we're going to see some text up there. Um, so that should aid you in the, during the poetry reading. But if you need to see her face bigger, you should be able to sort of drag the corners of the boxes um, and flick between the two things as necessary. Again, any technical things, just put them in the chat and I'll try my best to help you throughout the reading. Um, we are also joined, um, I'm very pleased to say, by Claudine Tutunji, another Kalkanet poet, um, and she and Claudine are going to be talking later on in the event um, and talking about Tara's new book, Savage Tales. And then towards the end of the event, there will be time for audience questions. So as well as finding the chat box, which I can see you guys are saying hello in, that's great, uh, thank you. Um, please find a separate button. It's called Q&A, um, and if you can get your questions for Tara lined up in the Q&A box, she'll be able to answer them towards the end of the event. Um, so I think that's all of the um, sort of housekeeping out of the way. Um, I'm very, very pleased that we're also joined uh, by Claudine Tutunji, um, who is, as I mentioned, a Karkinet poet. Her most recent collection is Two Tones, um, which came out with us. Um, a couple of years ago in 2020. So uh, if you don't know her work, please go and check it out on the Carcanet website. Uh, but I'm very, very pleased to invite her to join me on screen to begin this evening's proceedings. Thanks, Claudine. Thank you, Jasmine, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's, it's beyond lovely to be with you this evening and to be uh, here introducing the inimitable Tara Bergen. Um, I'm unfeasibly excited about it all. I'll try to contain myself, but I can't guarantee it. Um, what to say? Uh, well, we'll be chatting, as Jasmine says, a little later about Tara's dazzling, disturbing, and frankly, to my mind, mind-bending uh, third book of poetry, Savage Tales. When I got the call, so to speak, to uh, do this uh, this evening, I was simultaneously over the moon and just slightly freaked out because I'm, I'm such a giant sort of super fan of Tara and of her poetry's devastating capacity to blend dry wit, dark themes and serious innovation. And that to my mind doesn't even go halfway to sum up some of the stranger, more otherworldly qualities that we get in her verse and uh, the utterly compelling nature of her work. How does she do it? Nobody knows. Although we will be trying to delve a little bit into it tonight. And so, as Jasmine says, please do uh, find the Q&A if you can, if it's humanly possible for you, and pop your questions in there because um, later on Tara will be uh, addressing them herself after a bit of a chat with me and her readings of work. Tara's work will of course be well known to many of you from her previous two collections. Uh, her first collection, This is Yarrow, won the Seamus Heaney Prize and her phenomenal and Groundbreaking uh, second collection, The Tragic Death of Eleanor Marx, was shortlisted for both the T.S. Eliot and the Forward Prizes. Now in Savage Tales, we have a poetry that seems to emerge from the intersection between fracture and joy, possibly. I don't know, to be honest, it's, it's hard to pin down. We're going to uh, try, as I say, to do that a little bit tonight, but painlessly and hopefully, hopefully without incident, without pain. Um, but uh, 
one of the great delights for me on encountering her book was that I was able to do so without uh, too many preconceptions pushed my way. So I want to extend the same privilege to you and stop talking right now. And with great pleasure, hand over to the wonderful Tara Bergen. Wow, thanks very much, Claudine. This is great. What a, what a nice Wednesday I'm having so far. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. I will, I will chat a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about these poems before I start to read, because they are different to, um, well, in, in some ways different, <clears throat> excuse me, to the things I've written before. In particular, I suppose I need to warn you that the book is full of very, very short pieces that don't really look that much like poems. Often they don't even sound like poems. So we are left with a question, I suppose, as to, you know, are they poems? But maybe uh, that we can talk about that later. So that's a kind of a, a warning and uh, it, it might be sort of surprising as well because th th there's a sort of tone, a, often a kind of flatness of tone really, which made me a little bit worried about reading them aloud. I, I've, been, I've been wondering how I'm gonna do this for a long time. So I'm, I'm experimenting on you. I'm going to try this um, thing of sharing the screen and doing a, a, a sort of PowerPoint and um, reading them out, you know, and showing the words at the same time. Because, you know, in, in, the, in my last book, actually, in my second book, I really wrote a lot of the poems with the idea of, of performing them in my head. And it was great fun to think about rhythm and music and things, you know, as you're reading them. And this is a, a different process altogether. And, um, and, and so, uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. So, so let's see. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read for about five minutes and then I'll, I'll pause and Claudine and I can have a bit of a chat. And then I'll go back and, and finish my reading, which will take maybe another 15 minutes. So before I start, I'm just going to say a couple of th extra things. Um, oh yeah, the first thing is that the book is divided into nine sections and each section has a title. And I'll talk about what the titles are and uh, a tiny bit and what they mean. And also just to say that the way I did it, uh, did these things is the title comes at the end of the poem rather than at the beginning. So I'll read the short piece and then then there's going to be like slight pause and then I'll read the title, which is of that poem. It'll all become clear, hopefully in a moment. So here we go with the experiment. Let me see if I can first of all share this screen. And <clears throat> sorry for the cough. I, I have a glass of water here beside me so I can take a gulp of that if needs be. Hopefully you can all see my uh, PowerPoint which is just a black screen at the moment. And now there's a white line. If you can't see this, uh, please do shout out in the chat um, and we'll try and fix it. But hopefully now what's coming up in your screen are the words Savage Tales. Now, as Jasmine said, if you don't like this share screen thing, you know, feel free to escape and, and just use your screen as you want to and just listen. So I'm going to read, start with an extract from the first section in the book. And this is called, the section is called The Artist and His Sick Work. Now this is one of these uh, phrases that is kind of like an in-joke with me. You know, you know those in-jokes that you have with yourself. And I'd see this phrase and giggle away to myself because what I really like about it is the fact of when you say it, it sounds different to when you read it. So when you read it, obviously, we know that that's the Latin sick, meaning thus spelt, and in this case, kind of thus incorrectly said, because we know now that we can't use the male pronoun to describe all artists. So the artist and his sick work means that. But when you say it without reading it, it just sounds like the artist and his sick work. Sick meaning um you know unhealthy and um somehow disturbed and i like that double meaning because it, it does seem to kind of cover a lot of the um kind of problems i was having with my own work over the last few years and as i was writing this book and in fact this was uh, one of the working titles of the manuscript i think nearly all the titles of the different sections in this book were working titles at some stage or another over the last four years so here we go anyway i'll start the reading Tell me, he said, when our paths crossed on the green. Do they call you a poetess? 
Oh, I said, they don't use that word anymore. The subject field. I crawl on my hands and knees to my notebook. The crisis. The barman had a dog-eared copy of Japanese death poems underneath the counter. A bit of light reading, I said. Did you want to order something? He said. Japanese death poem. In the second state, I strike through the first state and sign again correctly. In the third state, I erase the whole thing. That's what April was like this year. Very torn up. April dogs. Oh, Rose, I said to myself as I unlocked my bike, thou art sick. Then I rode into the stinking traffic, feeling comparatively cheerful. Blake's Rose. We get a lot of riders in here, said the roller coaster operator, lowering the bar. The roller coaster operator. Sometimes it's not helpful to see the street as a place full of secrets waiting to be fathomed. The curb. Look, she said, lowering her voice. There are three ways this can go. Done to you, letting it be done to you, doing it yourself. Which one's it gonna be? The actor. When leaving for breakfast in the morning, I saw a small amount of hope had been left just outside my door. I took it downstairs to the receptionist. I didn't order this. Room service. We get a lot of writers in here, said the optician, tightening the screws. The optician. The artist does not work for money, but for his sick art. The artist. I speak to myself like a dog owner speaks to its dog. Leave it, I warn myself. Drop it. The bite. At 4 a.m., I speak to myself like a judge to the witness. Just answer the question. The trial. I say that I want the truth, but what I actually want is for your lying technique to improve. The lie. We get a lot of writers in here said the wine taster, spitting in a bowl. The wine taster. Hello. <laughs> right, that's um, my first part that I'm going to read. And Thank Claudia you, and I. I am here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> there was a little time lag there where I was just figuring out my controls. But thank you. That was wonderful. As a taster, a bit of wine tasting. Yes. See what I did there? Yeah, okay. Um, shall I just ask you a question? Would that be a good uh, Yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. just thinking now, what had we planned? Um, and it's all gone out of my head. Well, <laughs> yes. I, 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 I have, yeah, I, I was gonna go immediately off piece, which might, be, um, which might be unwise, but I don't think it will be. I just wanted to say, because I found it to be so addictive these poems and the whole book and I mean I, I think I told you at the time I read it in one go which is really rare for me uh being a, a person who's easily distracted and and so I felt like it it's it, it's it almost needs a health warning in your book you know this voice will not leave you alone it's so it's so addictive so I just wondered did it feel like that writing it were you kind of possessed oh that's a great question yeah I think I was I think um What's weird is, and, and what I meant to say at the beginning, actually, which I didn't, and then I realized I should have done, is that this book came out of a terrible um, struggle with voice, actually, a, a, a loss of voice, you know, I lost my voice. And um, I, I didn't know what to do about it. And I spent years, like after the second book, trying out loads of things. I didn't know it had happened either. I just kept trying and things weren't working. And I wrote loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff. I mean, really, a, a piles of paper were build, building up. Nothing was quite working. And I tried loads of things, tried essays, I tried play, I tried mm -hmm. novel. Um, 
And I realized that the pro, you know, after a long time, I realized the problem was there was no voice. I, there was the idea. I had ideas and I didn't know how to how to speak them. So the ideas were falling very flat. And uh, and, and so it was a, a point of, I suppose, what they call crisis, you know, where it was all over. Um, it was that was it. I mean, it felt terrible. I, I felt like I was standing, you know, on a pier. I could see the boat leaving. Uh, I should have been on it and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that was it for me. And so it was a, it was the end. And then um, I thought I'll give it one last shot and and try to try to go with <laughs> try to go with the, the lack, you know, try to go with that yeah. and see if there was anything in it that could become my friend, because at the time everything was my, you know, it, it was my enemy, you know. And mm -hmm. so then um, when you talk about being possessed, so I, I took time literally away from from all social obligations and would just uh, go to my desk and allow something to happen to take over and then that 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 strange flat as I was saying it's a kind of flat yes. voice but that started to, to to be more friendly to me you know and allow and, and allow itself and this character started to appear who was who, you know who was almost yeah. not a character you know and and then I could have fun with it well, it's almost like characters if, if, if yeah. I mean, you know, it struck me that there's so it's very peopled, the world of the book. And there, there seems like there's ghosts, there's many kind of slightly dubious authority figures. You've got you've got your, your giants of literature, Blake, um, Ahmed Tova, I think Prince, you know, Prince yeah. icon of funk you've you've thrown in as well. So I guess um, I just was trying to pin you down here and thinking, what is this? Is this like a theater of the mind? Is it an exploration of consciousness? It feels, you know, hot to me, uh, highly innovative, like a new genre. And um, but is it is it naff to try and pin it down and give it a name? Well, I couldn't give it a name. And that's why eventually, you know, it's 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 poems. <laughs> yes, and I, I tried for ages to try and think of some clever name. And that's why I was saying, you know, I'll call them essays because they're yeah. so sure to be hilarious, you know, and uh, and there's elements of that in it. And, and I think there's elements of of me not being able to to write an essay and me not being able to write a play and not having enough to write a novel. And the idea that a whole novel is, you know, gets cut down to a, to a line kind of captures both the desperation of all the, <laughs> this kind of cutting and editing, but also the fact of it being a poem, it's so ridiculous in a way, you know, to condense everything. And, and it's sort of a celebration of that, I suppose, as well. It's a total celebration because I should say it's for me anyway, it was I was guffawing, you know, I was laughing like a mad woman on occasion out loud. But also it's very um, unnerving and, and you combine that that humour with a sort of sense of, of slightly terrifying menace. And I, I wondered what you felt about humour in the book. That's nice. It's not, thanks so much for all these words. They're so helpful to me because I'm, you know, for a writer, like I'm terrible with vocabulary. You know, menace is a nice word, isn't it? And um, it yes, well, it's all that stuff that you have in your head, isn't it? The, the awful things you can think are usually about yourself, you know, when, and how you say something and then you turn around to yourself and say, oh, it's a ridiculous thing to say, you know, <laughs> and then all the misfiring, the social misfiring, there's, you know, I have great fun with that um, non sequiturs uh, that that those strange conversations you have where where you say something that that's to the side of what you should have said and you don't know why it came out that way. So I I, I love all that and I love the just the 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 the, the way it doesn't happen. Nothing's ha nothing happens and yeah. underneath that, therefore, there's this simmering of what might be happening and the. And the, and the sort of energy and and craziness that li lies behind this, but it's uh, it, it it is pulsating with energy. That's the thing. Whilst you say nothing's happening, it it's it's totally alive. It's like an organism. Um, I you you mentioned in your recent um, little Carcanet video clip, which is great and recently posted, um, that you talked about um, Samuel Beckett's letters being something you you've been reading, and you referenced his his comment um, as to why he swap, swapped into writing in French that he felt he would prefer to be ill-equipped. And mm. I wondered about that ill-equipped and whether you had felt at any point ill-equipped writing Savage Tales. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that that kind of, in fact, 
you know, I was thinking about that uh, thing about Beckett again, and the whole idea of translation, and that 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 idea that you sort of you're wading through something that you don't know all the nuances of, and um, that can be a good thing, obviously, as well, because things. The idea of being ill-equipped, I suppose, in life as well, you know, in normal life, and and there, and that's what makes things funny. And I think that's that happens in language as well. You know, when you're learning a new language, um, not that I'm have ever managed to do so, I'm ashamed to say, but you come across like a phrase that they have, and it sounds so beautiful and wonderful in their language. You know, when you translate it literally, to them, it's just just a normal saying and and we we start to feel and see language in a different way so so I think there's both the, the terror of being ill-equipped the absolute real terror for a writer to go to your desk and 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 have nothing and then right. and then at some point thinking well there's only one thing I can do and that is yeah. make it somehow work for me Yes, yes. Well, this kind of abdication of, of sort of authorial power, you, you've got that that incredible design feature that you, you, you mentioned briefly of the title being way down at the bottom of the page after quite a long white space occurring and, and, and it sort of swaps back and forth as well um, in a slightly pendulum like way. And I just wondered that, that having this, this brilliant idea of this kind of throwaway title and the way you've done it. Do you think that's it for you now? Do you think maybe you've had it with being authoritative top of the page title person? And are you always gonna have these afterthought titles now? Oh, that's another great question. I I know, I think I'll, I'll still have, hopefully there'll be the odd thing that actually looks like a, a poem, you know, that has a title and has some sense of, of narrative kind of flowing through. Um, but maybe with the short pieces, I'll, I'll keep this up because that was um, a whole process in itself, you know, and that's a, it's a fascinating process because you have to question, you have to go through like several layers of what you've, what you've written and think, what is it all about? And, I, and that came quite late in the process. I really, I thought I can't have titles, can't bear it. And then I thought, but I need something. There has to be some sort of turning back to just shine some kind of light on what's going on. And then I had great, a great time doing the titles because it really was just right. Each one was like, so what's the key for this one? You know, what is gonna unlock this? And some of them don't quite unlock them. I, I know that <laughs> there's still a bit of a struggle, but hopefully most of them you can read and go, oh yeah, I, I think I get it now, you know? They're brilliant. They're, 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 they're the mind bending thing. I mean, the whole thing is mind bending, but yeah, no, I think it's, it's uh, it's delicious. Um, yeah, it's it's. I mean, I think you you told me at one point that you did, you know, you were cutting back a lot. You you'd written a lot, and then a, a lot of it came down to sort of um, essentially cutting and cutting and cutting and finding the nub of it. Um, and we have these fragments, these wonderful fragments, as a result. And 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 at some point, I thought, and this is a cheeky question, but but humor me, please. That it was a little bit like reading a mashup between. Groucho Marx meets Emily Dickinson meets Basho meets Samuel Beckett, maybe. So what my question was, and I think every interview needs a stuck in the lift question. Uh, uh, if you were stuck in the lift with one of those, who would you prefer it to be? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> stuck in the lift. Right. Well, I suppose, you know, if the lift was going down. Yeah. Maybe Groucho Marx. He has that lovely line about... Um, if the lift is going down, he says, it feels like falling in love because you get a sinking feeling. <laughs> and then, and we'd be plummeting to our to our death. And I think I wouldn't mind die laughing, die laughing. With Groucho, no. With Groucho. Who else did you say? Uh, and Basho. Um, oh, yeah, well, um, Basho would be good for going up. If we were going hurtling up through the roof, Basho, you know, sort of spiritual enlightenment. That would be beautiful. Yeah. 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 Um, Emily Dickinson, I, there's a couple of things I need to ask her. Yes. What is it with the capital letters? I need to know. <laughs> uh, and also, I read somewhere that she had a very high voice. Where did I read that? I don't know. Oh. But I'm surprised. And so I'd like to find that out. Yes. Um, Beckett, though. Beckett and I have a, have a lot to talk about, although I don't know whether he'd answer my questions. He grew up just like around the corner from where I grew up. 
I grew ah. up kind of Dunleary, Black Rock, and he grew up in Fox Rock, much kind of posher than than where I grew up. But um, uh -huh. we could reminisce about the good old days in Ireland. I think Beckett would love that, don't you? I think he would. I, I, <laughs> I did not know you were such a close uh, neighbour. Listen, I'll just end now with one because we need to have time for your next juicy reading. Um, but this is, again, slightly cheeky, but I, I think also incredibly profound. So my question is, um, if if you were given the chance to do it, to do the whole book, Savage Tales, as a one woman show, would you run screaming into the night? Would you take the chance? And if you could do it, would you prefer to do it um, on a seaside pier at the Wigmore Hall um, in Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club or in a pub in Dublin? Oh, my God, your questions are terrifying. <laughs> Sorry. First thing is, I'm surprised, immediate answer, of course I'd do it, right? So no doubt about it, and I want to do it. But I might ask you to play me. <laughs> you're very, you yeah, me. Bring out my terrible Irish accent that I get told Yeah, of. but that would, be, that would be even better. It has, And I like the idea of doing all those venues and of it kind of failing, you know? You know, I can see, you know, those films where somebody comes on and they do the, the joke and there's like one drunk guy in the corner who laughs at the wrong point and some you know the barman drops a bottle or something that's how I could see it all playing out perfect perfect well on that note I'm going to disappear it might take me a while so you just get going okay and, right um, it was delight to talk to you thank you so Wonderful. much Tara. thank you thank Bye you now. I'm going to I'm going to go back now to the share screen and see what's going to come up next Oh, yes. Now, so this is another section of the book called and this one's called Campus Poems. And this tonight I dedicate to all of those wonderful people who I've had the pleasure to work with in classrooms across the world, um, especially those at Newcastle. And uh, this is for you. And I just wanted to remind you of all those times I've talked about persona and the Emily Dickinson quote, you know, about how the I in the poem is not representative of me. So this is my, my little disclaimer before we enter into the world of the campus poem. You at the front, I said, pointing to a student with their hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, what exactly is a campus poem? I nodded and smiled demonstrably, just like the instruction manual had shown me. Great question, I said, what is a campus poem? Several of the students raised their hands so I let them kill two birds with one stone. You at the front. In the film Taxi Driver, we see the city through a taxi driver's windscreen. Indeed, much of the film's power is due to this limited perspective. Every year I use this as an example, even though the students have never heard of Taxi Driver. Freedom within limits. I tell the students that etymologically speaking, the word conceive does not mean to make, but to take. Creative practice. When William Carlos Williams said, don't blush to write a poem, did he mean we should open up or close down? Blushing to write this. During the lecture on working practices, I made sure to speak only in the second person. Even so, the whole time I was talking, my face was very hot. Working practice. During the Q&A following the lecture on working practices, I made sure to speak only in the third person. Even so, the whole time my hands were very animated. Q&A. Engulfment, implosion. Petrification, a writer without words is desperate. The divided self. You at the back, I said, pointing to a student with their hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, what are night terrors? I nodded and smiled demonstrably, just like the instruction manual had shown me. Great question, I said, what are night terrors? Several of the students raised their hands, so I let them experience it for themselves you at the back. Right, moving on to the New Romantics. Claudine mentioned Prince. And yes, the New Romantics is reference to my 1980s childhood. And um, also though to kind of the strangeness of, of love and, and encounters in the modern world. 
laying out his little clay hearts, the potter said, they will all harden soon. The pessimist. In hindsight, it strikes me as odd that when X mistook my tenderness for sadism, I didn't think he's misunderstood me, but rather he's seen something I didn't know was there. Penetration. That was my era, I say confidently, the new romantics, even though it's nothing to be proud of. My era. Romantic. I wandered lonely. New romantic. I only want to see you dancing in the purple rain. Let me guide you. Somebody took a photograph of Prince leaving a pharmacy in Minnesota. It's a poor quality picture, a low resolution shot of a man dressed in black, but it has a very high value because of what happened next. Prince at the chemist. I included that last one because I think um, that does sort, sort of capture uh, this idea of something about to happen. That, that, is, that is an idea behind, there's a lot of blank pages in this book, but I'm hoping that they contain this, this sense that something has just happened, something's about to happen. This is another section called Strange News. And this one um, is hopefully trying to capture those things I was talking about earlier about that social misfiring, the non secretaries, the conversations that don't kind of match up. Um, all, all the, the strange things that, that happen in, in everyday life. When everything was over, she took me aside and showed me a bear's paw that she had wrapped in a scarf in her handbag. Is it yours? She said. My daughter says it must be. We think you left it in the cafe. I wasn't in the cafe, I said. I didn't even know they had one. The claw. For the party, I baked little cakes and decorated them with paper butterflies. You can eat the butterflies, I told the kids, but they hesitated. Eat them, I said. They taste like Christ tasted when I was your age. Edible paper. I never listen to the radio, says the young woman scalding my scalp. How does that feel? Dead ends. I showed it to him. He liked it. He took it and used it. Now I want it back. Colony. The bus pulls up and the door is open. On clamber the philosophers in their black eye makeup. The mothers and toddlers wait behind. The toddlers wave goodbye to the bus's windows with padded gloves. One calls hello by mistake. They still know nothing of separation. The bus moves off and all the mothers break apart. The school bus. Right, I'm keeping my eye on the time, so don't worry. I've got a couple more sections to read from, but I'm not gonna read as many from the sections. Now, one of the sections is called Four Dances. And this, um, this is where th there's a bit more, there's some more words in these, in these pieces. And there are four pieces. And I just wanted to talk about them to you a little bit. And there's some pictures, so pictures are always good. Um, yes, you can describe these as ekphrases, I think. You know, that thing where one art form describes or um, responds to another art form. And these poems, as I said, you know, this like many years of struggling and trying to write and not knowing what to do with myself. So at some point, anyway, I watched this, I think, brilliant documentary called Pina, which is about the German choreographer Pina Bausch. And it was a film made by Wim Wenders or Wim Wenders. I'm not sure how you uh, pronounce it, but let's call it Wim Wenders, which sounds better. Anyway, in this documentary, some of the famous dance scenes by Pina Bausch were reenacted, reperformed, but not always on the stage, sometimes in like parks or by the motorway or something. And it, there was and re it's really good music. And it was just, um, it's really, I found these really compelling, these dance scenes. And there were also clips from the original dances as well. And the writing of the poems came about while I was watching these and I, I and at the same time I, I 
all this stuff was going on with me. This this thing about restriction and reducing everything right down and ed- everything sort of being edited too much, you could say. Um, I was at this very weird phase of questioning everything, resisting all poetic devices, it seemed, unable to even break a line, you know, as we've discussed about the titles, resisting all of that, seeking um, without finding a tone and a voice. And therefore, I suppose, naturally, but kind of alarmingly to me, everything started to turn into um, an obsession with the fragment, with the stilled moment, and of course, uh, the, the, the single sentence. And certain things started to um, be of, of great interest to me, and, and it, I was attracted to things that were very factual and very kind of um, plain, I suppose you could say, the found object, the instruction, the transcription. These were the sort of things that I was looking at and, and, and thinking about a lot. So this idea of extreme brevity started to, to be something I was thinking about more and more. And as I started to watch, watch these dances, I was reminded rather than, than, I, than seeing this as a problem that maybe this was a surprising form, a new form for me to, to try writing in. And therefore I was also reminded of this quote by Kafka, which is just when everything seems over with, new forces come marching up. So it was that idea that I got from watching this film, which is, yeah, it's, it's a, it, it seems really desperate and terrible, but, but maybe you can do something with this. And so I tried to take on this idea of the transcription and the flat flatness to see if I could come up with any way of, of using these, of doing something with these dances that I was watching. So this is what I came out with. And I, I called them like, like transcriptions of dances. I'm going to read two, two of the dances. The first one is short and the second one's not so short. So the first one is called the season's dance. First, my right hand opened through my left hand. Then my right hand touched my forehead. Then my right hand fell downwards like a leaf. Then I made two fists and held them up in the air. Now I have lived a whole life. The inspection dance. I was wearing my long pink satin dress and high heel shoes, and I was standing in the middle of a room. All the men had to fight their way through to stroke my hair, touch my face, prod my stomach, and pluck the skin around my collarbone. They lifted me up and shook me to see if anything would fall out. When they slapped me, it was like you might slap the rump of an animal. At some point, I'm not sure exactly when, all the men went away. It's hard to remember. And finally, I've come to my last, the last poem that I'm going to read, and this is actually the last poem in the book. It comes in a section, section nine, which is called Constructions. And this was again something, one of the many projects I was trying out, which was when I became obsessed with, with this idea of constructing poems, um, seeing how, you know, making different shapes on the page and using found pieces and so on. Um, so, so there's a few of those in this section, but the very last poem actually has more words in it, I think, than any of the other poems in the book. And you'll see this, the words build and build and build. So they actually, you know, are almost a page long, which was um, kind of incredible. And, and I like the fact that it's at the end of the book. So it feels like, like we're leaving in, in a hopeful word, world, word filled word, world, God, shouldn't put those two words together. Okay. So this is the last poem I'm going to read. And before I start, let me just say again, thanks to everyone very much for listening and for watching. We will have a chance to chat and look at your questions now after this. So, quartz. Say you take a piece of quartz found on a building site on the side of a road, and you put it on a sheet of paper on the windowsill on a sunny morning during the holidays. Not yours, theirs. Say there's nothing to do. They say that, not you. Say it's warm because of the sun, yet cold in spite of it. 
Say your own soul is dark like the coal in the hod, or like the soot at the foot of the coal bunker, the soul no one sees but the disappointed shovel. Okay, say the coal man knows, but he never dwells. He has raised his status where you retained yours. Say you take the magnifying glass and look through it at the quartz and say you see it shine and say it blinds the soul that bothers you, pulls at your hem. Say it is a spotlight onto your good side. Say it warms your cockles and muscles and makes you put them in a barrow. Wheel them like babes by the light-filled river and sing them away. Say you're this, say you're that. Say the light dazzles, distracts you from your own complications, shines or blinds the self out of itself like cauterizing a wound. Say cauterize, say sear, say hot, iron, pleasing for it do be old fashioned. Today a blood blister, tomorrow I eat from your spoon. What next if we already share spit and injury? Say blame, say hope. Say it in the cold dark of day so that your breath crystallizes and I can pluck it and wear it as a brooch. Say it. No one wears brooches anymore. Thank you very much. Right. Um, you've done great now for those of you who, who are still here and you've, you've listened to all that. Let me have a look at the questions and answer box to see if there's any questions there for me. And I'll, I'll go through if there are any and see if I can answer them and then you're free to go. So let's have a look. I'm just wondering, I don't know what order these come in. So there's a few, excitingly, let's have a look at the first one. So I'll just take them as they come. Um, from Sarah, how did you come up with the device of putting the title after the poem? Incredibly effective. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm very pleased you thought that was effective. It, you know, as we, as we discussed, this came quite late in the process and um, playing around with different ideas and, and that weird thing, like, like your hand being forced, you know, when Claudine mentioned being possessed, like thinking, I can't, I can't do it. I can't have a title. And, and then, then just sort of thinking, there's gotta be something. And uh, after playing around with things, I thought, oh, I could put it at the end. And it seemed less intrusive that way, almost like you can read it or not. And you can read it first, you can read it last. And um, also though, there's a little extra thing in it. I quite like that. There's a little, you know, an extra card in there. Um, it's not like a punchline and it's not really the answer to a riddle, but it, it, it reminds me of all those things. I'm glad you thought it was effective. Um, oh, Michael Schmidt, I better answer this one now. Um, the ill equipness Claudine talks about is to me more like Kafka than Beckett. Interesting. See how little you can get away with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even as a publisher, I don't feel shortchanged. Oh, I'm very pleased. Um, but I hope this isn't the end. <laughs> I do too, Michael. I do too. Um, I like, like both aspects of the writer are all three. That's nice. The next book will be Unlock the Different Key. Yes. I, I, I'll, I'll, God, I'll have to keep that and pin that on my desk. Everything Michael says comes with a mysterious kind of truth and just, just believe it. Um, so everyone take note. The next book will be unlocked with a different key. Thank you. I, I think you're right. I know you're right. Um, Jules, hi Jules. Uh, what came first, the text or end title? Um, Yes, wonderful question. So I suppose the text, but the text is like loads of stuff in it and, and the title kind of came out of that and there, it's all so in, entangled and it's all like so squashed out, you know, it, like so much has gone in and it's been wound down and then the tiny thing has come out <laughs> at the end. And so the title was like born out of that thing. It all sounds very mysterious, doesn't it? Which is terrible because I'm supposed to know what I'm doing, uh, but I don't. Um, Amelia, hello Amelia. This was absolutely wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, so the question is, how did you find the experience of reading these fragments for us tonight? Yes, compared to your other work. And um, do you have fragments which didn't make it into the book? And how did you decide which ones to put in and put out? Oh, great questions. How did I find it? I enjoyed it actually. I think having the PowerPoint there and the words 
um, helped me because, um, oh God, I don't want to go on about this too long, but I really enjoyed with my last book, I learned all the poems or most of them uh, off by heart to read them out. And I, and I really liked doing that, you know, as a performance, it felt uh, very enjoyable. I used to get kind of really excited and terrified by it, but I, I felt like there were voices that, that I was performing. And so this one, I was really worried because I thought, I don't know if I'm going to be able to remember them all, you know, because they're not, they don't have much to kind of, they're only short, but at the same time, that's sometimes harder to remember, you know. And so it was nice to be able to read them and have you read them at the same time. And I do think, though, that it needs that explanation. And uh, again, these are questions I ask myself, is it good to have loads of talk around a poem or should you just be able to read it without talk? So these are all questions. I'm not sure. Like, I, I do worry that it's a bit like, I feel a bit like sometimes it's like dropping a stone down a well that's really deep and no one really hears the stone fall and everyone's like, is, you know, is that it? So there is that worry. But here on my own, I can, I can, I can feel okay about it. <laughs> um, oh, and, uh, you know, do you have fragments that didn't make them into the book? Yeah, I did. I had quite a, lot, quite a lot that didn't make it in. And even at the last minute, I took a few out. But I'll tell you what was really difficult was it, it's a, it has a cumulative effect. And that's another thing about reading them aloud. I think almost the, the book itself, you'd be better off reading them all. And then you get that funny kind of balance thing, don't you? When you have lots of fragments, they all start to to say, to start to like sing and talk to each other and stuff. Whereas when I'm, if you, and so if you start to take them out and thin it down too much, uh, they they really start to wobble so it's kind of I had to be careful um but yeah I've loads I could do a whole other book but as Michael suggested maybe not um so thanks for those questions that they are great a couple more if we've got time we've got um few minutes because I don't want to keep you all here too long um oh Mary Jane hi Mary Jane there's a sense of um satire or tankas of Japanese death poems yeah as if one voice dies and another rises out of it. How nice. And there's a sense of <clears throat> rhythm, oh, the rhythm of the haiku and the compression of the aphorism. Again, you all, you all say things so well. Um, lots of white space, yes. Do you think that the semiotics, um, space shape image, thank you, become in some ways way to close the gap between language and what you want to say? Yeah. The ineffable because these poems are like walking around an art gallery with the title underneath yes what a clever idea where you and some of us only read the titles don't we? we don't look at the pictures but i think it makes the reader more active in the poems participation that's a very nice idea i like I, that's nice and i think you know just kind of like drift maybe away from uh, uh, answering such a great question um but maybe it will that you know when i read short things um, I, I kind of, I like being able to laugh at them and feel that the, you know, revel in the craziness of it, you know, and, and, uh, and feel a part of it. And sometimes, yes, yeah, just sort of feel like I'm not alone. So hopefully this, this will have that effect, you know, if it has that participation effect and, um, and then also other people can write theirs, their short fragments. Um, so I'm glad that you felt that. And it raises expectation perhaps is, it's our voice that gets a moment to shine. Perfect, that is wonderful. And I'm, gl and I'm glad you mentioned the white space because again, this was a, a kind of big thing for me, having all that white space and the worry of that and worrying. And, and again, like the thing of something forcing your hand. I knew it, I knew I couldn't do anything else. I knew that was it, um, but I was still worried about it. So that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, a question from Louise. As an art educator in art galleries, I always found that the real excitement happens in the space between the work of art and its viewer. Do you interrogate, interrogate others' responses to get your pieces? Oh, sorry, to your pieces. <clears throat> How interesting. Thank you. Um, the work of art and its viewer. Yes. Um, do I, I'm scared of responses. I'm, I'm a wimp, really. And um, I, I write in a strange way um, and uh, I think I've got to, I, I don't know, no, I don't, I don't interrogate other people's responses. Um, I don't get with that many responses um, at all because I think I, I doubt everything I do so much that I think it's not ready to show people ever. And then it comes out in a book and then I'm kind of horrified <laughs> by what I've done. <laughs> 
Ah, it's a ridiculous way to live. I know, absolutely ridiculous. I, I, I realise that, you know, there's this strange split in me that I assume somehow that the book is kind of anonymous. And so um, I, I get a shock when it's not, but I don't want it to be anonymous. Of course I don't. So, you know, the egotist meets the recluse. Um, and I think, you know, that's what poets are really. Um, and Adam, thank you for doing this. Your poetry has been full of excitement and exploration. Oh, that's wonderful to hear from Adam Crothers. Um, has this latest innovation in your writing changed your relationship with other people's poems? That is, have your readerly tastes and, and sensitivities been altered by this new approach? I think that um, maybe the other way around in that I, 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 um, I was reading a lot of short pieces and uh, found that I really liked them. Um, but I also noticed that uh, I thought I thought that to myself I like, but I don't. They're not the only things I read, and in fact, some of the poems that I admire most are not at all like the ones I write. I was trying to work out why what this was all about, and I realised that I think what I get that really in, what I respond to in other writers is the thrill and excitement that I get when I read them, and that thrill makes me want to write and makes me want to write something. Um, honest as in the thing I can do you know and so it's not it's almost like not so much I want to write like them but the excitement I feel at reading another good poem makes me want to write something do something and I like and I like that creative um urge uh, a question from Peter very nice old-fashioned is meter and rhyme dead no way no way you know and and again, it's like, this is funny, isn't it? When poets or anyone, do, okay, let's stick to poets, let's stick to me. When I do something, it's it's not because necessarily I want to be like that. You know? I love uh, rhyme actually, and music and, and poems. And um, it was horrible not, not having that. So I had to go this other route and go down this kind of deadpan I suppose you could call it but um no way you know and in contemporary poetry the the beautiful formal poems that are being written now are uh, are like very advanced I think and um so I'm, I'm pleased to say I would say from what I can see no and I hope it comes back to me as well <laughs> um Kate Arthur it's fascinating to hear where you took inspiration from Pina Bausch have you experienced had you experienced the flat voice you mentioned before you started on these poems or how did the dance help you develop that voice? Um, the flat voice, I think, came out of um, this idea of maybe maybe out of not knowing how, how to uh, respond in a beautiful musical way that I felt was up to, to the or origin of the original. And so thinking the only way I could do it was to, um, was to say it out really flat and without kind of expression almost. And, and it was an experiment to see how, what happened if I did that. And also I, I can remember doing it and I, you know, you know, terrible self-doubt where it almost stops you writing. And I was thinking, this is ridiculous. I don't even know what I'm doing. And I thought, but just as an exercise, what happens if you just write out how you remember the dance? Like just, it was all just an exercise, you know, to fill the day, to get me writing. So I would kind of write it out and and then I, so I wrote it out like she does this, she, he does that. And then I thought, well, what happens if you change it to the first person? I do that. And then something happened when I changed it to the I and, uh, and yet still talked in this really flat way. So there's this, so all this kind of weird stuff starts to come out. And so that was an, an interesting process. And it all happened just because um, I didn't know what to do. Um, these are great questions. I'm going to have to just I think answer one more because I mean I could talk to you all, all day about my work <laughs> um, but I won't and you'll all have to go off now and take a break so I'm just going to read this last one from Lucy McDermott who I think is writing from Manhattan um, which is very exciting altogether. Uh, Lucy says I loved your campus poems I'm really glad you did. I was reminding, uh, reminded of your sonnet about Catherine yeah from my first book who missed class and also your take on the educational manual that talked about the two kinds of learners. Yeah, the Susan and Robert one. Yeah, good fun to write, actually. And um, I hear the true Tara note in these, the restrained ferocity. Uh, Lucy, you know me too well. Thank you very much. Yeah, they're, they're good to write, aren't they? And, um, and 
and thanks to all of you who have helped me in writing those. They've been great. Thanks, Lucy. I, I, there's there's a few more wonderful questions. Uh, hopefully, um, we can copy these and maybe I can reply to you personally. But I'm going to stop talking now and just thank you all very much for uh, being here. And it's been fantastic. Thanks a million. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Tara, and congratulations. And thank you guys um, for participating so brightly. Your conversation in the chat has been amazing and your questions were great. Um, thanks also to Claudine um, for your wonderful input earlier in the event. Um, so the last thing for me to say to you is please go and buy the book. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat. Um, I'm sorry that the discount code is restricted to buyers in the UK, but please do go and buy a copy of the book for yourself and for your friends. Um, and the final thing I want to ask you to do is join us again next time. Um, we are launching a book by Zoe Scolding, her first Car Connect collection, um, A Marginal Sea, which is uh, published um, this month also, um, and we're launching that on the 9th of November with Harriet Tarlow. So please join us then. That's in the chat for you as well. Um, so that's everything. Thank you again. Congratulations, Tara. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off now, but I'll leave the chat open for your last minute messages. Uh, so. Thank you and good night, everyone.